for political junkies following the U.S. election, there's only one show that's been there to watch. It's called The Circus, and it follows, often from the inside, the maneuvering going on between the various camps. Here's a sample. Huge crowd, big day, arguably one of the most important days politically for Hillary Clinton. This is the day when Bernie Sanders will be endorsing her. Bernie Sanders kind of squeezed all the juice out of this he could, and it's finally time for him to cross the bridge and bring the party together. She's got to have a completely unified Democratic Party in order to win. Well, one of the hosts and producers of the circus is Mark McKinnon, longtime political strategist and commentator. He's in Cleveland tonight, and he joins us right now. Well, Mark McKinnon uh, wasn't planning to start off on the today's story, but it's hard to ignore. It's quite something. But tell me, in, in your view, is this, you know, is this a one-day wonder, or does this really tell us something about Donald Trump and the people around him? Well, it's a big unforced error, and it creates drama where the Trump campaign didn't want it. They have four days to communicate their broad message about why Donald Trump should be president. And his wife actually had a, what appeared to be a great speech, and then it all fell apart. And, the, you know, the, the Trump campaign often prides itself on the fact that it's a lean campaign, that there's not a lot of infrastructure, which allows them to be nimble and quick, but, and that it's put together with spit and glue. But this is what happens when you don't have a real infrastructure of a campaign. It means that they didn't have that person on the third level in the basement checking the speech and vetting the speech and making sure that it was perfect. Is that what you're finding out after today? I mean, uh, you got a lot of sources in the back rooms. So is that what you're hearing happen? Oh, yeah, there's no question. I mean, th this was a vetting problem. They didn't have the right people in the right place checking the speech. I mean, th that's just a campaign 101 that you've got to do. And, you know, it's not that difficult. There's, there's software that, that, you know, teachers and universities use and campaigns typically use uh, to make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen. So they have wasted a day now, at the very least, of one of the most important days of the campaign. Well, it's also been, you know, a week where a lot of people are trying to plug into who is this guy? Trump after watching off and yeah. on for the last year they're now getting this chance to see and one of the puzzles is you know this is a guy who often you know misspeaks he you know he, he changes his mind he, he, he kind of bends the truth some say he actually lies yeah have you ever seen anything like this in a US election campaign I've been doing politics for 30 years I've never seen anything remotely close to this I mean this is unconventional by any standard uh, and, and by the way, he has uh, confounded the critics and uh, the pundits from the very beginning. And, you know, none, they didn't think that he'd win the, 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 you know, any of the primaries, much less become the nominee. So it testifies to just what kind of a different election we have going on here and just how angry American voters are. But how does he, how does he get away with that list that I just went through? Is it, it, you know, they, they call him the Teflon man. Like, how, how does he get away with it? Yeah, I'll tell you how he gets away with it. Well, though he gets away with it because it is something so different than what people have ever seen. He's just not a typical politician. And the way he acts, the way he speaks, the way he, you know, he's, he's kind of he's kind of post-political in many ways in the sense that he'll take a position, change his position. And people don't seem to mind. And they don't mind because they just say, you know what, we need a bull in the china shop to break stuff up because we we tried the other way. That didn't work. Let's try something completely different. And Donald Trump is that. Well, given that, he's he's probably going to get away with this past 24 hours, too, right? It'll sort of move on. Tomorrow they'll be talking about something else. Well, the one thing with Donald Trump is you know that there's going to be something dramatic and different that happens very quickly. Uh, so, I, yes, I think that this could be ancient history within a day or two. What, who is this guy, really? I mean, you've had the opportunity to, to kind of watch him behind the scenes, to talk to him, to talk to his family. Uh, tell us something about him that would, that would surprise us. I mean, what is it about this guy? Who, who is he? I, I think what would surprise you, surprise a lot of people, is he, he's behind the scenes and in private, he's actually a pretty lovable guy. You know, he's, he's actually kind of soft and warm and fuzzy, and he's very family-friendly and very charming and very polite. I mean, that's kind of the inside piece that you don't see about Donald Trump. He's a big-time entrepreneur and showman. I think, and there's some evidence to support it, that he never really expected to be here. I think he thought this would be kind of a fun little exercise, go out there and, you know, mix it up, play with the media a little bit, maybe win a primary or two here, be competitive. But at the end, I remember a year ago when, he's, when asked what his chances were, he said, ah, oh, maybe 30 percent. I don't think he expected to be here. And I think what happened is he won the primaries and he kind of looked around and said, well, that wasn't that hard. Might as well go ahead and just take this thing all the way home and see if we can just win it. So who's the real guy? Is it the guy we see or is it, is it that warm, fuzzy guy you see in the back rooms? 
Oh, I think it's all of those things, and you you know you have to put it all together. And part of what a campaign about is to get a sense of what this guy would be like under pressure and in the big chair. And you know, we've had some opportunities to do that. I mean, there's been and it's been on our show. We had a, a particular day. It was like uh, the the bombing in Belgium, I believe. When I was on the trail with Hillary, my colleagues were in Mar-a-Lago in Florida with Donald Trump on his property, and we saw in real time how he responded to that incident in real time. You got the call from your friend this morning. You already were scheduled to do a bunch of morning show interviews by phone. Did you consult anybody about what to say? Did you no. talk to anybody now? No. So I don't have to consult. Look, I say it from my heart and my brain. Right. It's not just heart. It's heart and brain. And that's what I do. This morning, in the midst of a huge national security story, you're on network shows. You get a call from your friend, you watch a little TV, and then you just say what you want to say. I say what I think is appropriate. You know, we got a sense of what the man, and that's what these campaigns are all about, is to give us a chance to see how he would respond if actually elected president of the United States. One of the things that's become clear, uh, too, is the fact that, you know, he's very close to his family. He listens to his family, his family, whether it's his sons, daughters, uh, his wife, he, he listens to what they have have to say. There was one part of uh, one of your shows had, had this little uh, moment where you talked to his son, Donald Trump Jr. Watch this. Over here we have Donald Trump Jr. because it's all happening in Elko today. Hi. Hey, good. How are you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, nice to see you. Sorry. How's it going? No worries. You know, being confident in a campaign means not taking anything for granted. So Trump made a last minute decision to send Donald Trump Jr. in here. Doesn't want to leave it unprotected to Cruz and Rubio. Smart move. So there's no question that your father's yeah. tapping into the uh, people who feel disenfranchised. Correct. I mean, just what you're yeah, if you're right? frustrated, you're voting for Trump. Uh, I think that's what my father's done a great job of, is bringing people who haven't shown any interest in politics in a long time, if ever, and saying, OK, now here's someone you know, that's saying what I think. I can back them. And, and all of those people uh, say, someone has to change the game. Thank you very much. I know this is also set up more as a, as a Q&A, but I want to just say uh, I'm really happy to be up here in Elko because this is the kind of place where I would be spending my free time. So the family as, as strategists, as participants, you know, how, how, how different is this really? Uh, you know, is, is this really a different kind of campaign as well with the reliance on family? Sure it is. And, and by the way, Donald Trump Jr. is one of the mo most interesting characters that I've talked to during the entire show. He's a fascinating guy. He was compelling, interesting, authentic, candid. Uh, you know, and I, I, I mean, if you'd met him on the street, you'd been really surprised to discover that he's a Trump. I mean, Elko, Nevada is in the middle of nowhere, and they loved him up there. But yeah, I mean, the family, are, they are smart and articulate and polite. And uh, they, they make a great impression. You know, in a certain extent, when you, we evaluate our candidates, you look at their families and, you know, you look at the kids and they turn out pretty well. And you say, well, something's going on right there. They got good values, you know, good presence. And uh, so uh, somebody's done something right. I want to show uh, another part of your show. It, it's one of my favorite scenes. I think it's one of yours as well. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a back room in a restaurant with. You know, it kind of looks like a movie, the power, the elite from the Republican Party, you know, whether they're smoking cigars or sipping on wine or scotch or whatever it is, and talking about the situation. Now, this clip is from quite some time ago in the campaign. It's interesting to listen to what these guys were saying about Donald Trump then. Watch this. Everybody around this table that I know, we've been in every presidential campaign probably since 1980 in various degrees. And in Trump's problem, you, he doesn't have a compass. You don't know what his compass is. And how problematic is that for the future of the party? I think before it's all over, it's going to be hugely problematic. I talk to people all the time, as I'm sure everybody around the table does, and they say, why don't you Republicans do something about this guy? I'm sorry, this is not the Soviet Union. We can't call a meeting and decide Trump is out. And we hate that. Yeah. <laughs> Benign dictatorship, who's for it? Trump is doing well for one reason. He understands the, the, the climate and the culture of America today better than anybody at this table. How do you feel about the fact that the Republican nominee may be someone that none of you know? Shell shock. Bewildered. Republicans are hierarchical, respectful of authority. Small we fall in line. And Trump has interrupted that cycle. Donald Trump, nobody thought of him as any kind of political leader until six months ago. He's not articulate. He's not poised. He's not informed. All he has going for him is a lot of votes. Why hasn't any of that hit home? Here we are. Here we are.
Martini. I love that. Some great mo moments in there. That was, as we said, some time ago, and they kind of represent uh, many of the Republican elite who distanced themselves from Trump. Has that changed at all? Are those guys back in the tent at all? A, a lot of them are. I mean, a lot of those players are very practical politicians and players in Washington, and they recognize that the power is shifting. But that was a remarkably candid moment, uh, you know, where it was, I, I was quite surprised to see them as candid as they were. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it testified to just how uncomfortable the Washington establishment was with Donald Trump, but, but it felt a lot like he kind of dropped into a Mafia Don meeting and we're just overhearing, <laughs> you know, kind of the turf like battle uh, for power. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, given the fact you've seen so much over these past months, uh, we're a couple of days away from what could be the biggest moment of the week, which is his speech, not just to that convention, but to the uh, American electorate. Which Donald Trump's going to turn up for that one? What, what are you expecting? Well, I remember working for George W. Bush and, and going into his convention speech. He, he had this odd confidence, and I asked him about it, and, and, and I said, why are you seemingly so confident and relaxed? He said, because I know when I go out there, more people are going to see me than ever before, and I feel honest about this speech and what I'm saying and that it's going to reveal who I am. This is Donald Trump's, it's, to your point, there's a lot of confusion about who this man really is. Thursday night is the opportunity for him to speak clearly, candidly, and lay out a vision for the country and also to give a real sense of who the real Donald Trump is because, as you put your finger on, I think there's some confusion about that. We see, you know, the hot, the cold, the behind the scenes, the, the public Trump. Who is it and what kind of president would this man be? Thursday's the opportunity for him to put that forward. Can one speech turn the doubters around? Yeah, it can. Uh, I've seen it happen before. I mean, the, the, the convention speech has more power and more potential to turn more voters' opinion around than any other event in the campaign, more than the announcement, more than anything else. This is the opportunity where you control your message, more people will see you. So, yeah, it's a huge opportunity. And uh, so we'll see if Donald Trump takes advantage of that Thursday night. Mark McKinnon in uh, Cleveland tonight. We, we appreciate your time a lot. I know it's a crazy day, and you probably have quite the show lined up uh, uh, following all this. But we, uh, we thank you for doing this. Tonight. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you much for having us.